Good morning, evening, really early in the morning, depending on where you are, everybody. Welcome to the Tomcat track for Tuesday, September 29th. We're going to get started with Mark Thomas, who is going to be presenting the state of the cat, a review of the past year or so of Apache Tomcat, and a look forward to what's expected in the next 12 months. Mark is a longtime committer on the Apache Tomcat project, and I will Go ahead and disconnect my audio. Take it away, Mark. Thank you very much, Chris. Well, welcome everybody to the State of the Cat presentation. For those of you who don't know me, you'll find me posting on the Tomcat mailing list as markt at apache.org. And I've been a Tomcat committer since about 2003. My day job is with VMware, where I have a very simple job description. It's essentially go and do whatever I think is best for Apache Tomcat. So whilst I have other responsibilities at VMware, and I'm involved in other projects at the ASF, and also a few things at the foundation level, I get to spend the vast majority of my time working on Apache Tomcat. So as Chris said, this is largely a retrospective, going to look back over what's been happening in both the community and the code in the last 12 months. But I'll also take a little look at future plans. If you have any questions, please do pop them into the chat. We'll allow about 10 minutes at the end of the session for questions, and we'll deal with them then. So let's start with the community. We have around 2,900 subscribers to the list, at least we did yesterday when I, I checked the current subscriptions. So those people are asking questions, answering questions, or just sort of sitting in the background watching what's going on and learning that way. In the last 12 months, we've had 80 contributors. Those are people who have submitted translations, patches, pull requests, and have had those included within Tomcat. And back in July, we welcomed Ray to the ranks of committers. So welcome, Ray. He's working on OSGI and JPMS, getting all of the metadata in the Tomcat jars, both in the jars for Tomcat embedded and in the standard Tomcat distributions into a state where they work as expected in those module environments. So that brings us to a total of 19 committers and 28 PMC members. Of those, about four committers are active and 15 PMC members. The reason for that apparent imbalance is simply that active committers tend to get invited to become PMC members. So generally, active people tend to move towards PMC membership. If you're wondering what the difference between the two is, essentially what it comes down to is PMC members' votes are what we call binding when it comes to releases. The ASF has a rule that says for a release to go out, you need to have at least three PMC members voting in favor of it. And a majority of all of those PMC members who vote must also vote in favor of it. Favor of it. And what that does is that makes the release an act of the foundation rather than an act of the individual release manager. And what that gives us is a legal shield. In the unlikely event that some, somebody decides to sue because a Tomcat release or any other Apache release has got uh, material they think infringes copyright or trademarks or something like that, because the release is an act of the foundation, it's the foundation that gets sued, not the individual release manager. And speaking as a release ma manager, that's quite important. That said, PMC members are not the only people we want to want to vote on releases. To my knowledge, we've never needed to use the legal shield. It's a nice insurance policy, but actually what's much more important is that end users take those release candidates and test them and let us know if you find a problem. There really is very little that's as frustrating as running a release vote for four or five days and about 30 minutes after it's ended and you've just announced it and the um, the emails have gone out, every, everything's up on the mirrors. Then you see the email on the users are saying, I've just downloaded the latest Tomcat whatever release. And when I do this, this happens. Is it a bug? And you look at it and think, yep, it's a bug. And if you told us about it two hours ago, 
we could have fixed it and incorporated it into this release round. As it is, it's going to have to wait until the next one. So one of the one of the things you can do in order to contribute back to the project, and there'll be several of these that I'll mention throughout the presentation, is download the release candidates, test them, and let us know whether they work for you or whether they don't work for you. Uh, both sorts of feedback is useful. And as I say, you don't need to be a PMC member. We accept that sort of feedback from absolutely anybody. And I would say probably in 99 out of 100 cases where somebody has sort of drops an email to the dev list saying, oh, I think I found a problem. We said, yep, we've cancelled the release. We fixed the problem and we've restarted the release process. Whether that person's a PMC member, a committer or just an ordinary list subscriber. We, we pay a lot of attention when people say they found a problem with the release. So I say that's one of the opportunities you have to get involved. Your vote really does count. Other community things, events have obviously been a little bit different over the last 12 months. Uh, the last in-person event we had was Apache Con Europe back in October 2019. You can find the slide decks for those on the Tomcat website, along with decks and often audio and or video recordings for quite a few of our past presentations. If you're looking for information on a topic that tends to get covered uh, in conference presentations, so that's typically things like clustering, reverse proxying, TLS, those sorts of things. There's a lot of good material on those topics in those presentations. And if you've got questions in that area, I'd strongly recommend you have a look there and then bring any additional questions you have to the mailing list. You might not be aware that earlier this year, Google provided the Tomcat project with $5,000 towards improving security. Our initial plans were to come up with a security hackathon. Uh, that was going to be face to face. Um, obviously, the, the money would then pay towards travel and the venue and things like that. That's obviously off at the moment. And we're currently discussing on the users list what we might be able to do virtually as a, not necessarily as a replacement, possibly even as in addition to that, because it's certainly early indications are that the virtual event is going to have much lower costs. So we might be able to do several of them. We shall have to see. But if you've got views on what you think should be in a security hackathon or a security event, then please speak up on the users list, add your contribution to that particular thread. A couple of years ago, we opened up the Tomcat translations to effectively everybody. Um, we moved the data over to poeditor.com where we then import it regularly into the releases. And that project is set up so absolutely anybody can contribute. So whether you've just run Tomcat in your native language and you've realized that there's a typo in one of the messages, or whether Tomcat doesn't have your native language and you'd like to translate all, what is it, three and a half thousand uh, messages, I think it is, then you can join the Tomcat project at PO Editor and start making those contributions. As I say, anything from a single translation all the way through to a complete language um, would be more than welcome. In the last 12 months, we've seen Chinese and Japanese join French and Korean at 100% coverage. Obviously, English starts at 100% coverage because that's the language that all of the messages get written in first. And then obviously things are translated from there. But we've also seen additional translations and improved translations in Spanish, Czech, German, and other languages as well. Now, obviously, it, that platform supports hundreds of languages. And if we have translations a complete set of translations in all those 100 languages, then the Tomcat um, distribution is going to get quite big. And we don't really want to be in a position where a Tomcat distribution is 100 meg, 99 meg of which is Tomcat, and 91 meg of which is translations. If we ever get to that point, then we might need to rethink things a bit. But for now, the translations are a relatively small part of the Tomcat download. And once a language reaches a critical mass, which is the, at the moment is somewhere around 5 to 10% of the strings being translated, then we include it in the standard distribution. You're probably aware we migrated to Git a couple of years ago, but we didn't quite migrate everything. Um, we've continued to see a steady stream of PRs from Git, which is great. And we migrated ModJK to Git this year. Uh, the reason we, it was migrated then was essentially not much had been happening in ModJK, and it got to the point where we had some changes to make. So as we were uh, touching the code base anyway, it seemed like a good time to move it to Git. So that's what we did. Of the modules that are still left in SVN, those are the Tomcat website, the Taglib subproject, and the Tomcat Maven plugin. Website is unlikely to move to Git anytime soon, not because there's anything particularly wrong with Git. It's just that 
The nature of the website is that Git and FCN, SVN serve it equally well. There's no particular driver moving the website towards Git. So at this point in time, I don't see anybody stepping up and volunteering to do the work to do that. And if somebody does, that's great. It won't, um, it's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just that that's fine. But as I say, there's no, nothing particularly driving that at the moment. Taglibs is a somewhat dormant project. Given the recent, well, not so recent now, move of Java EE over to Jakarta EE, then I think the Taglibs project is probably heading towards retirement. And that's a discussion we really need to have on the mailing list. But I suspect that's where it will end up. So Taglibs will move into the Tomcat attic we have for modules that are no longer being actively supported. The Maven plugin, uh, that's a module that sees a steady stream of user questions and bug reports and occasional pull requests. What we don't really have is anybody to look at those. So another opportunity to get involved in the project, if you know a little bit about Maven, you know a little bit, bit about the Tomcat internals, or you're willing to learn about those, then the Maven plugin is somewhere where perhaps you could get involved in the project. Essentially, if somebody comes along, produces a test case that one of the existing committers can run easily to say, yep, this is where you do this, you get this exception, there's a clear problem. You apply this patch, the problem goes away. Um, please apply the patch. Then the committers are going to do that, do that a few times, and you're going to quite quickly find yourself with commit privs on the Maven plugin project. So another opportunity for you to get involved in the community if you so wish. Moving on to talk a little bit about the code then. We had our first Tomcat 10 release this year back in February, and then that joined Tomcat 9 and Tomcat 8.5 on the monthly release cycle. You'll notice that for those, we have a release most months, but a couple of months we didn't. Those were January and August. And that's quite simply that those months occur are after holiday periods. And as it happened, there wasn't much in the change log come the beginning of January and the beginning of August to really justify doing a release. So we pushed, it, pushed them back till the next month. Tomcat 7, uh, because that's approaching end of life, end of life for Tomcat 7 will be March next year and end of, end of March next year. So because it's, it's approaching end of life, and to some extent because of the refactoring that took place between 7 and 8.5, not everything that lands in 8.5 gets backported to 7. So there's not always as much in the changelog to justify a release. Hence, Tomcat 7 releases tend to happen every two months rather than every month. Uh, Tomcat Native and ModJK, they're both in a sort of active maintenance mode. So as we receive bug reports, they tend to get fixed. And then depending on the bug report will depend whether or not a release will follow. So for example, if the bug report is, oh, there's a typo in the documentation, it's, yeah, thank you very much, we fixed it, but no, that's unlikely to trigger a, a release. But if, um, as I think we had for ModJK in the last day or so, a bug report that says, ah, in these circumstances, ModJK is sending this invalid HTTP header, then that's going to get fixed and that is the sort of bug that would lead to a release. And then, so it's quite likely we're going to see a mod JK release in the near future. In terms of sort of the frequency of those bugs, we get them, for native it's been roughly every six months for the last few years. Mod JK, it's been somewhere between six months and a year. Um, but they're on that sort of release cycle, but they will continue on that sort of release cycle. They're act they are actively supported and actively developed. It's just that they're really in that maintenance mode where it's bug reports that, that drive the releases. There's not very much in either of them in terms of new features at that point, or rather at this point. Our relationship with OpenJDK continues to be a good one. Um, the number of bugs we've reported to them has slowed down quite a bit. Um, as has the severity, as has the, the progress on the bugs we do report. Um, it actually happened earlier this week, the last bug report got fixed in the latest early access release and that release got um, published. Uh, what we're now waiting on is backports and that does take a little bit of time. I'm not overly concerned about that simply because sort of the, the bugs we're reporting are pretty edge case bugs. I mean, the most recent one was if you're using JDB, which very few people do, and you're using it with Tomcat, which even fewer people do, and you're using it with uh, command line parameters that need to have spaces in them, 
which is a, you know, a vanishingly small number of people, then there is a problem. Um, it's a small enough problem that nobody's actually noticed it. It's actually something we noticed while we were testing something else. Um, so it's probably not that big a deal that it's going to take a few months for those fixes to get backported. Um, other things that have been happening in the OpenJDK world, obviously Java 13 has reached end of life in the last 12 months. Java 14 has been and gone and Java 15 has arrived. We do test all of the early access releases with Tomcat. Um, it's unusual for us to ha find problems. I think back in Java 11, we found an issue with um, a change to logging that triggered a spurious error message when Tomcat started. Um, that got fixed before um, it went GA, so that wasn't a big deal. The other things we're testing for are more that Tomcat has a number of internal optimizations that depend on it knowing things like all of the classes in the Java Lang package or the names of all the character sets supported by the JVM. And knowing those things lets Tomcat do a few things a little bit more efficiently internally. So what a lot of our testing with early access to do is running the unit tests that check those things. And when new classes get added to Java Lang or when a new character set gets added, then we just add that to the, the list of things that Tomcat knows about. We do aim for Tomcat to be buildable with any current Java version, and it is. However, there is a bit of a caveat. And the caveat is that as the JVM has developed, then so has the Java doc tool, and it's got rather stricter about what it will and won't accept in terms of Java doc. So whilst you can build uh, the current Tomcat with the latest Java releases, you'll have a bit more difficulty if you try and produce the Java doc. And this brings up another opportunity for you to get involved in the project. Uh, try building Tomcat with the latest version of Java, see what Java doc problems get reported and then provide PRs to start fixing them. There's quite a few there. Last time I checked, I think it was well into the thousands. So lot, lots of work to be done there. Um, so again, another opportunity to get involved if you wish. Picking up a few code metrics from the last year, we fixed about 150 bugs. So what's the average about three a week? Um, there are another 95 bugs that were resolved. Those would be either duplicates of the 150 um, occasionally uh, invalid ones and very occasionally things that we say, well, yes, that would be nice, but no, we're not going to implement it because yeah, that's a really invasive feature that would create a whole lot of instability and provide functionality that only really a small number of people use. That would be better as a custom extension rather than as part of Tomcat. But generally, um, yeah, about 95 bugs resolved in addition to the 150 individual issues. We typically have five open bugs. These are sort of in the category of, well, the report looks valid. What we can't really tell from the report is, is there a JVM level problem? Is there an OS level problem? Is there a Tomcat level problem? Is it an app level problem? It's one of those, we know there's a problem there somewhere, but it's really hard to reproduce. We can't tell what the root cause is, so it's very difficult to fix. And at any one time, there are around five of those open, and they tend to be evenly split between all the possible possible root causes. We do eventually figure out what the problem is, um, and once we do that, then the bug the bug is either fixed or closed as appropriate. But there's typically about five of those open at any one time. It might be worth mentioning at this point that excluding those bugs, any bug that is reproducible we will fix all of those bugs before we do a Tomcat release. So every time we do that monthly release round, then at the point where we do the release, all of the repeatable Tomcat bugs that we know about will have been fixed. So Tomcat has a very, very low open bug count um, compared to other projects of a similar size and or age. So as well as bugs, obviously there are enhancement requests. There are about 80 open at any one time, and that's been fairly stable over the year. Um, as some enhancements get implemented, new ones get raised. So the, the actual open number stays about the same. We've also had 135 pull requests. That's probably led to around 40 to 50 actual changes to the code base. Um, the reason for that discrepancy is to, several really. Um, Sometimes people support, provide multiple pull requests for different versions of Tomcat. So that's really only one change. Sometimes if we ask for a pull request to be updated, rather than updating that pull request, what will happen is the existing one is closed and a new one created. So that creates a bit of churn there as well. But 
So over the last 12 months, we've had 135 of them, and as I'd estimate that's resulted in about 40 to 50 changes. In terms of total lines of code, that hasn't really changed. Um, whilst adding new features, add lines of code, at the same time, we deprecate old features and we remove the associated code. So the overall size of the code base has stayed about the same, give or take a, a few hundred lines of code over the last 12 months. Moving on to talk about sort of notable security vulnerabilities we've had in the last year, I think there are two that particularly stand out for me. The first one is 2020-1938. Uh, that was the AJP request injection vulnerability. The Tomcat community is known for, well, for a while, uh, pretty much ever since um, the project started, that it was possible to inject requests into the AJP connector. What wasn't as well understood until we had received the associated vulnerability report was just how far you could go with that and some of the things you could do. Um, there's some very um, interesting work that went behind that vulnerability report. And that led to a reassessment of the risk of having AJP open and us deciding that actually that's a bad idea. So that essentially changed the defaults for AJP connectors to be uh, not enabled by default. If you do enable it, it only listens on localhost. Um, you need to provide a password um, just to sort of a very simple uh, authentication between the two ends. Now that did, we know, break quite a few configurations, but it was one of those situations where on one hand, you either break a few configurate, well, break a lot of configurations, let's be honest, and, but at the same time, protect all those users that unknowingly are exposing their AGP ports to the internet, which various scans told us was happening, versus, okay, we don't break the existing configurations, but we leave all of those users you know, quite significantly vulnerable to attack. And from a balance of risk point of view, we took the view that breaking the configurations and protecting people was, was the better option. And the fact that the configuration should have been fairly easy to fix with new configuration options was, was, a, was a big part of that. Moving on to look at 2020 uh, 9484, that was a remote code execution. Now that, in from one point of view, is about as bad as it gets for a security vulnerability. On the other hand, there were a number of prerequisites associated with that particular issue that meant it was pretty unlikely that you were going to be affected um, if you had a public facing Tomcat service, I think it would be very unlikely. If there was going to be um, any vulnerable systems, I think they're more likely to have been vulnerable to the knowledgeable insider. And even, even then, just the number of prerequisites meant that there'd be a very small number of those systems that would be vulnerable anyway. But it's worthy of note because it was remote code execution. And again, that was a, it was a, a nice find of the uh, reporter that found that one. Those have obviously being fixed, um, you know, make sure you're on the latest version of Tomcat to ensure you pick up all of the relevant updates. Um, I'll talk briefly about new features. Uh, Remy's got a session on this later, but the ones that I particularly wanted to draw attention to, obviously I've, I've talked about the AJP defaults changing. Um, the JMX lifecycle listener, that was originally conceived because of functionality that was viewed as missing in the JVM. Since that's been available, the JVM has slowly caught up, adding features over time, and we're now at the point where there's nothing you can do in the JMX lifecycle listener that the JVM can't do for you anyway. So there's essentially no point having it. So it's been deprecated, and it will probably be removed fairly shortly. Uh, other thing I'd like to mention is ALPN support in Java 8. When Tomcat 9 first came out, we are in a rather strange position that Tomcat 9 implements version four of the servlet spec. Now, servlet four requires support for HTTP2, that's fine. HTTP2 requires support for ALPN. Servlet four also requires support for Java 8, and at the time, Java 8 didn't support ALPN. So you're in a strange situation where there was no way with a standard JVM that you could implement the servlet spec and be spec compliant. Now, Different servlet containers took different approaches to solving that. The approach we took in Tomcat was to, if you wanted to use Java 8, then use it with the APR native connector where we have access to OpenSSL, and then we use OpenSSL to do the TLS. It supports ALPN and everything works. Um, now, newer versions of Java 8 have had LP, ALPN support backported, so you can now have a pure Java 8 
based Tomcat stack with HTTP2 support. Um, and it was Remy who did the work to backport to make ALPN detection work with Java 8. So thank you for that, Remy. I've mentioned Jakarta EE a few times. I've got another session on this myself tomorrow. We'll go into more detail about what's happening there and how it fits in with Tomcat. But very briefly, Jakarta EE9, which is the release that's being worked on at the minute, is a package rename. So everything that's in the Java X package is moving to the Jakarta package. Um, that's obviously quite a significant change. That's expected by the end of the year, and it will be supported in Tomcat 10.0. So more details on that in my session tomorrow. In terms of future plans, uh, I'm expecting Tomcat 10.0 to be beta end of this year, beginning of next. Uh, Tomcat stable to be fairly short. Tomcat 10.0 to be stable fairly shortly afterwards, simply because 10.0 and 9.0 are very, very similar in terms of code bases, and we know 9 is stable, so there's no reason that uh, Tomcat 10.0 won't be stable either. So I'd expect stable release to happen fairly shortly after the first beta release. We are seeing over at Jakarta EE some discussion around producing minor specification updates and the servlet spec is looking at one that would add support for the same site cookie attribute. Um, if those happen between Jakarta EE platform releases, then the relevant Tomcat version will pick those up much in the same way we did when um, the servlet spec and the other specs produced service releases back when things were run under the JCP. Looking a little little bit further ahead into next year, then um, work is likely to start on Jakarta EE10. That will be supported by Tomcat 10.1. Um, more detail on that in my talk tomorrow. So to wrap up, lots of ways you can get involved. If you'd like to join the users list, answer questions, ask questions, test release candidates, uh, report bugs, report bugs with patches uh, or pull requests would be even better review and or add to the existing translations. There's all the Java, stock, Java doc stuff that needs fixing, the Maven plugin, or whatever it is that happens to float your particular boat. I and mean, one of the things that is very noticeable um, over my years of involvement with the project is that if you work on something you're interested in, you tend to stick around. So pick, if you want to get involved in the project, pick something that interests you. Uh, Talk to us on the mailing list, dive in, get started. We'd love to see more contributors. And with that, I'm going to wrap up and see if we have any questions. OK, Chris, I can't see anything in chat at the minute. So either my chat stopped working again or we don't have any questions. If you could join and read out any questions you can see, that would be a big help. Certainly. Um... Chat seems to be working for me. Can you hear me OK? Yeah, I can hear you. I just can't see anything. All right, let's see. I didn't see any questions uh, as we went. Uh, I was kind of commenting within the chat here. Um, if anybody has a question, please go ahead and drop that in the chat. And while we wait for some questions to come in, I will plug our um, next session, which um, you, you will actually have to switch sessions every time. Even though there's a Tomcat track, you won't just stay here and automatically go to the next session. So if you like to attend the next session, you'll have to exit the one you're in and join Felix Schumacher's Lost in the Docs. He's going to discuss the um, loads of documentation and features that are uh, surrounding Apache Tomcat. And that will get started actually in about 10 minutes, so there's plenty of time to ask questions here. Um, let's see. Oh, Brooks has a question about, okay, so. Oh, is AJP still supported in Tomcat uh, version 10? Yes, uh, AJP is, is still supported and will continue to be supported. Um, people often mix up AJP, which is the Apache JSERV protocol, which is the dedicated protocol for, for communicating between a reverse proxy and Tomcat, and the APR native connector, which is essentially a native low-level IO implementation. 
that we are um, likely to remove from Tomcat 10. We're just having a discussion about that on the dev list earlier today. Um, and essentially the, the reasons for removing that are that it was originally added for performance. Um, as far as HTTP connections are concerned, we can get reasonable similar performance from the pure Java connectors. For TLS, then we can get similar performance from the Java connectors when we use the APR native code just to wrap OpenSSL rather than doing all of the IO as well. And by limiting what we use the native code for, it's a much smaller surface if we just use it to wrap OpenSSL. So essentially there's less opportunity to go wrong. The problem when we go wrong with native code is we don't just have a null pointer exception, we tend to have a JVM crash. So there are st stability benefits for using as little native code as possible. Therefore for Tomcat 10, this, it certainly looks as if the discussion is going in the direction of removing the APR native connector so it doesn't do the low level IO, let Java handle all of that, but we'll continue using it to wrap OpenSSL where we want that particular option. But AJP in terms of the reverse proxy protocol that's supported by ModJK, uh, by ModProxy AJP, and by the uh, IS uh, API redirector for Microsoft IIS or whatever it's called these days, uh, that will continue to be supported. I'll put in a plug for a session tomorrow where we'll have a presentation on um, migrating away from AJP. Um, that's, I think, the third session. Ah, yes, the a AJP versus HTTP debate. <laughs> yes, if you'd do like you to, start, get do you want to start that now, Chris? Or? <laughs> Uh, the, the short version is there There are pros and cons of, of both, and it kind of depends what you want to do. Um, I, don't th I don't think there is, either of them are perfect in all scenarios. Um, Chris may have different views and tune in tomorrow to find out whether he does or not. Mm -hmm. Also tomorrow, there's a session on uh, reverse proxying with Nginx, where Igal is going to be talking about how to do that. Um, he doesn't seem his... Uh, in his pricey here, whether he's gonna what protocol he's going to discuss, but I I believe that Nginx supports AJP, so that will probably be a part of that as well. There is another question: Does the back of your mug say minus one? Perfect. Yeah, um, I don't know whether the swag store that we got those from is um, st still available. Um, I really should add add that to the Redbubble store that um, we manage. So the store where pe uh, you can get conference t-shirts, uh, we also have, um, this is an advert, something completely separate. We also have um, all sorts of swag with logos of lots of different Apache projects on. And if, your Apache, if the Apache project logo you want isn't there, drop an email to uh, the com dev list, the community development list, and we'll get it added. But yeah, I should add a plus one, minus one logo as well. Get that onto a few more mugs. All right. I'm seeing a handful of folks jump into the session uh, just as we're wrapping up here. If you've just arrived and you're expecting to see the following session, um, please note that you will have to actually leave this session and join the next one. They will probably appear in the hop-in interface in two or three minutes. So if you're waiting for the next session, please look out for that. Anyone else have any questions for Mark? Have I missed any other questions? Don't think so. Oh, actually, there was a question a little earlier. Would you mind redisplaying your slide with the release history and schedule? Uh, yeah, I can do that. That, that one. Was there a question about that? Yeah, somebody asked. It, it appeared that there was a release for 7.0 scheduled for next year. So that may just have been. Uh, really well, that's, that's October last year through till September this year. Ah, um, if okay. that's not obvious, October, November, December, January, February, March, across the top. Um, Generally, uh, as I say, sevens on two monthly releases. Um, they'll, that will continue up until 31st of March next year. 
where Tomcat 7 will be end of life. That experience tells me what we'll probably get is actually the final release will be in the first few days of April. Um, so that's usually the way things end up working out. Um, but yeah, that will then be, that will almost certainly be the final Tomcat 7 release. That being said, um, in theory, there's always the possibility of another release. As long as there are three PMC members that are prepared to vote for it, then you can have a release. Um, I've never seen it, uh, I've never seen that happen, but in theory it could. I see that, um, uh, no, it's not. So it's not this year. Into, yeah, I see the question. And it wasn't this year into next year. It's the last 12 months. Sorry, I should have made that a bit clearer. I'm putting year, years on that slide or something. Yeah, so that, that's looking back historically. What which release? What releases have we had in the last year? I guess spot when Mark went on holiday. Okay. Any more questions? I believe that's it. Uh, oh, hang on. Oh, oh, yeah. Right. Did you get the text? You're getting texts again. I'm getting texts now. Yay, uh -huh. it's working. Uh, OK. If we, So the question is, if we want to get ready for APR removal in whichever Tomcat version, would we switch to a non-APR connector and the native SSL handling? Uh, would we switch to non-native and the S? Native SSL handling would be turned on off within the Java HTTPS net. Yes, that's correct. So the way Tomcat works now, if you, by default, if you take a default Tomcat install and you make the native code, the native library available, then what will happen is Tomcat will start up if, and it will use the NIO protocol by default so if you have an HTTP connector, by default, it will use pure Java NIO for the HTTP connector. If you have an HTTPS connector, by default, it will use NIO. But because the native library is available, rather than using JSSE for TLS, what it will do is essentially wrap OpenSSL and make it look like JSSE, but it will use OpenSSL to via the native code to do the TLS. So essentially, if you want to get ready for APR now, then the simplest thing to do is just switch from uh, explicitly asking for the APR connector to explicitly using the NIO connector, and the um, OpenSSL bit will automatically happen for you. If you want to check which version you're using, when Tomcat starts, if you look at in, in the logs, each connector that starts up, it will have the protocol, which will be HTTP or HTTPS. It will have the implementation, which will be NIO, NIO2, or APR. And if it's HTTPS, it will then be followed by JSSE, if you're using the pure Java implementation, or OpenSSL, if you're using the OpenSSL version. And then it'll have the port number in the label for that particular connector. So you can tell very quickly when Tomcat starts up exactly what connectors you're using, which is why when people come onto the mailing lists and ask us questions about connectors, we usually say, can we see the logs, please? Because it's that little phrase is the bit we're actually looking for. It tells us exactly which connector and TLS implementation you're using, which sometimes isn't the one people think they're using, which is hence why we ask for the logs, just to make sure what's going on. Uh, you're welcome, Brooke. Happy to help. So that was Brooke's question that I just asked, answered. Um, yeah, Constantine's just mentioned um, the work that's being done with GraalVM. I suspect Remy's going to be talking about that in his session. Right, we're, this one's about to run out of time, so I'm going to wrap up there. Thank you all very much. If you have any more questions, please do drop them into either the Slack channel that's associated with the conference or drop them into the users list. We'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much for your attention. Enjoy the rest of the conference.